broadcasting from San Jose on iyada.com. It's the Wrestling Observer Live with Dave Meltzer. All right, we're back with our QA with Dave Meltzer. This is going to play on the Patreon, which you're listening to right now, as well as the Fight Game Podcast. Dave, I'm going to be out uh, out of town for a couple weeks, so I'm using this as one of those weeks for the Fight Game Podcast so we don't go dark. Another one is a John and I doing a pro wrestling draft where everybody in the U.S. is available, and how would we draft them? Based on their value and importance in wrestling, that's 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 actually very a very interesting topic. Yeah, I think uh, especially especially right now. Yeah, like uh, I I, th- I think so. Okay, are you, are you that... trying to like are you trying to like prepare for the future? You know, what I mean, <laughs> so so that's definitely part of it. Yeah, looking for the future. So, I, in with that in mind, I think the two top picks in the draft, and I would actually be interested in your thoughts on it. Because of uh, Roman Reigns' visibility and he's just the most famous guy in wrestling, I think he'd have to be one of those two picks. But I think the other one, when you're talking about young people and longevity and future, I think the other one's MJF. It's an interesting pick. Um, I mean, when you're talking about long term, it, it, I mean, Roman's phasing out. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I mean, it's like for today, you know, you would go with like Roman Reigns, CM Punk, Moxley, um, Seth, you know, the guys that are on top. But if you're talking about years from now and you're going with the guys, you know, under 27, yeah, MJF could be um, could be a top pick for sure. Now, with that in mind, do you think like like Adam, were... Adam, Adam Page could be another one? How old is Page? 29, 30 in that range. How long do you think Reigns would Reigns has left as a? I guess a, at this point he's a part time wrestler. He's not even full time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that all depends on Hollywood. Um, if he has uh, some luck in Hollywood, like Cena, then probably not that long. I would guess. If he doesn't, you know, work in this part time schedule, he could go. You know, he could probably go as long as his health goes. I mean, he could. You know, I mean, conceivably go five, ten years. I mean, ten years. Um, I mean, forty six, forty seven. Um, you know, I mean, if, if you're going part time, it doesn't beat up your body as much. And I think that you you would have, long, you know, limited dates. You'd have a lot more longevity. OK. And and, and less staleness, too, from yeah. doing limited dates. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right. Let's get to the first question uh, from Preet. He says, when AW decides to do a stadium show, what city do you think will give them the best chance to be successful? And if they do a stadium show... Should they aim to create a tradition of a yearly stadium show for a special pe- uh, pay-per-view, such as their version of WrestleMania? I would say first year should be Toronto, um, just because, you know, because because to me, the, the places to go would be your debut markets. Um, New York, I mean, if you, if you consider Arthur Ashe Stadium, stadium, they've already done it. But if you're talking about something bigger... Um, I mean, New York is always in consideration. Toronto uh, would be a big one. London, um, I think Los Angeles. Uh, those would be my picks, but my first pick would be Toronto. Uh, Chicago, of course, would be another one under consideration. The only reason I don't say Chicago is because they run it so often that, um, you know, I mean, they have, they have a big fan base there. And I think a first stadium show, maybe it would it would do really, really well, you know, just be, by the idea of it. And if you have the right, you know, the key to the stadium show is the right attraction, not just, hey, we're going to run a stadium. You know, I mean, um, WWE tried that in Vegas with the wrong attraction and, and it didn't really work. Um, so and, and you know, you don't want to fail. You know, you really want to go in there and do 30,000. And that's a lot of people. I'm not saying it's impossible for them to do it, but um that's a real challenge. You know, I mean, no matter how you slice it, WWE is bigger, but you know, um, and, and, you know, they're going to get 30,000 for SummerSlam and obviously for mania, you know, ne- you know, we're, we're talking whatever it's going to be, you know, like this, this year was close to 60, both, both nights. So, um, you know, but mania, mania is also a giant, giant tradition. Uh, by the time people listen to this, the G one will have already started, but Jeremy asks, what uh, is your favorite G1 tournament and uh, a favorite block match that comes to mind when you hear that question? That's a tough one. Um, God, favorite G1. Um, I'd have to look 
back. I mean, the one Omega one and the year after was real, real big. Um, but I think all of the ones from like, say, 2016 to 2019, you know, before COVID uh, were, were very, very strong. I, maybe my favorite, I'm thinking 2018, maybe. And I mean, as far as um, block match, um, you know, I mean, I think um, Tanahashi, you know, Tanahashi Ibushi was a final. Um, but some of the Tanahashi Okada's Omega and I believe it was Naito, which was uh, um, Omega and Ibushi was was a, the, the, the that one year was really really big. Um, you know, some of the the Shingo Takagi and Ishii, Ishii and Ibushi with a ex with a Ishii Ibushi with a um, uh, you know asterisk because they went long and they did a lot of dangerous stuff. Um, Omega and Ishii um, was I just remember that one. Um, you know, AJ and, and, uh, um, Minoru Suzuki and, um, you know, Mudo and, uh, Vader, Mudo, you know, I mean, for its time, um, Shoshu and Hashimoto that I went to Mudo and, um, which I don't know that that was fantastic in the building because of the emotion. I don't know that, but on television, I don't think that carried over nearly as much. I was actually at that one live, but, um, um, Mudo and Hashimoto was a final, um, that, that I remember, you know, thinking that it was like a completely outstanding match, you know, in the nineties. Um, but there's, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of finals, but, um, yeah, Omega and Omega and Ibushi was pretty, was pretty amazing for what it was, especially because it was a match that was designed to build for a couple of rematches. And of course we haven't seen them for a variety of reasons and we may never see them at the level that we wanted to, because I don't know if these guys can be at the level that they were back then, you know? So, um, but, uh, I thought that match was really, uh, really incredible. So, uh, you know, people who are looking for matches, there's your, there's your list right there. Go check them out on, uh, in, in JPW world. Okay. Uh, so from Ryan, this is kind of a funny question. When was the last time you were generally, su genuinely surprised by something that happened on a wrestling show? Um, I mean, I always get surprised, um, you know, whenever they do a surprise, I'm usually surprised. Maybe the, um, the sting return by an AEW was, was oh, a yeah, bigger, a, a bigger surprise than, uh, than most. Um, cause I had no clue that that one was going to happen. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty big one. Um, mm, I'm trying because a lot of the WWE, you know, things um, weren't that big a surprise. I mean, they could have been like Austin wrestling, but I I knew that one was coming. But you didn't know that Brock was breaking the WrestleMania streak, did you? Oh, absolutely not. No, no, that was a pretty big. That was a, that was a huge one. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, you know, yeah, that one in. Uh, I haven't called up beating Bruno, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was a little kid, but that one was, uh, uh, you know, but of course I, I knew about it three months later from the wrestling magazines, but when you saw it in the wrestling magazines, it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can you even imagine? Like, I mean, you can imagine because you lived it, but how, how slow things passed, you know, back then? I know. It's not like we, it's, it's funny because people went to the building and, you know, you could get phone calls, although I was nobody in wrestling getting, you know, I wouldn't be getting phone calls. I did get a phone call when, um, a couple of years later, cause I was somebody in wrestling by 73 when, uh, Morales lost to Stasiak, but, um, that, and then, you know, Bruno beat Stasiak. So I knew both of those, um, that week and actually, um, we were kind of tipped off because on the Los Angeles show, uh, they they did they did an announcement at the Olympic Auditorium about uh, the Bruno Bruno San Martino Don Leo Jonathan match at Madison Square Garden for the title, which was announced in Los Angeles before Bruno won the title, uh, because it's you know it played in New York two weeks later. So by the time it played in New York, um, people would have known it, and and the idea of giving that away in Los Angeles. Um, their idea was that nobody would know, but you know, they did it in, in the ring at the Olympic. Um, Jimmy Lennon made the announcement. Wow. Yeah. 
Um, okay. they, 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 they also on, it was a member on, on Wednesday night when Terry Funk beat Jack Briscoe to win the NWA title. I'm watching this thing. And in Spanish, and during the commentator, the commentary for the match that night, they announced, um, you know, that uh, Terry Funk won. It was in it was in Spanish, but I heard it, cl- pl- you know, plain as day, which was a big one. And then um, I remember I was in college when Flair beat Dusty in Kansas City. And it was a Saturday and, and, and San Jose State was playing Stanford and I was about to go to that game. Or no, I can't, was coming back from that game. I was coming back from the game in the afternoon and I was um, I, I had the thing, uh, you know, uh, videotaped. And I started playing it, and they opened the show telling you that, hey, Ric Flair won the title on Thursday night in Kansas City. So this was on a Thursday, and the show's on a Saturday. So obviously, I didn't hear about it until Saturday night. So it took two days for that one. And and when when I remember when Flair, I mean, when um Dory Jr. lost to Harley Race, I would say I didn't know for two weeks. And, and that, you know, like like there was a day where I got like five different letters talking about it, but it was like, a week and a half, two weeks later, it was like a long time before. And I was like stunned because Dory was a four year champion, too. All right. From Darren, he said, historically, how successful has women's wrestling been in Mexico? Has there ever been any particular period or stars where women have been a big part of the shows? I mean, um, um, was it Irma Aguilar, Irma Gonzalez or like? kind of like the legends but no you know never never like one of the top even 50 historical figures and maybe even top 100 historical figures in in you no, know, no, no way top 100 100 historical figures in mexican wrestling you would not have a woman crack the top 100 no way so no now obviously with uh stardom sort of being uh hot do you think that that could ever happen in mexico um, anything's possible, but I don't see like someone there and the way that they do things. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say never, but the, the, it's, it's not looking like that's going to happen. I mean, even, even in Japan, when you talk about, um, you know, the Jackie Sato or Chikusa Nagayo, you know, that were, that were big mainstream stars, they were still kind of like fad people as opposed to, the guys that were more, you know, enduring stars. It's like there was an audience of teenage girls for a couple of years that were really into it. And they still maintain popularity later, but not that big. Like I, I wouldn't say, um, you know, if you had your list of your biggest stars historically in Japan, um, there would not be a woman near the top. Um, I, I wouldn't say, you know, um, you know, as far as biggest mainstream stars, no. You know, even though, again, like, you know, Chigusa Nagaya was mainstream, you know, for a couple of years, it was more of a fad thing with teenage girls as opposed to, you know, someone like, um, you know, Stan Hansen or, or you know, Ricky Choshu or any of these million got people who were enduring stars for decades. Okay, I'm, I'm assuming this is just a yes or no question because you probably can't say unless these stories are really old and information already got out. But John asks, are there any stories you had to sit on for one reason or another that would have been like giant headline news had they got out and you would have been the the reporter on them? There's probably some... Um... You know, I, I, yeah, I, I, yes, I guess is the answer. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely stories that I knew that I was pretty much told, you know, you can't, you know, it, as soon as it breaks, you can go with it. And, you know, when somebody else breaks it and I'm one, I remember, you know, Brian and I knew, and I'm figuring, okay, it's going to break any day now. And it like was eight days before it broke. And I was just like, God, someone, someone break this story. <laughs> I know the whole story. I'm about to write about it. But, but yeah, no, I was told like, you know, you, you cannot break this story, but this is the story. And when, when it gets out, you know, you know, you got all the details, you can go with that story. Now, have you had, have you ever like written anything knowing that it's like, at some point in the next few days, this is going to break, and I just need to have it ready to fit into this observer, which goes out on Thursday or Friday. Like, have you pre-written anything like that? No, never. Never pre-written anything. You know, it's just like, um, 
people go, oh, yeah, you have these obituaries ready. And it's like, no. I remember when Kowalski was dying, Killer Kowalski, because that was like a two-week process. And I would not start it until he was legally dead, even though, you know, we all knew it was about to happen. Um, that one comes to mind. You know, most of the ones I don't know about, you know, that they're dying two weeks ahead. Um, but no, I, I never uh, pre-write anything, um, you know, any big story or anything like that. Because if I do, you know, the, what ends up happening is, is that I got to rewrite it anyway because the new things happen. So I just don't, I just don't do that. All right. So from Paul, what level do you think Rampage would have to sink to in terms of the main demo before TNT would cancel it? And how would that affect AEW's bottom line? Um, I don't know how the contract works. So, um, I mean, it, it probably would, you know, if it got canceled, it, you know, it depends. Again, it depends on the new contract and, and, I don't know that there's a number because like, look at these sports properties, you know, like major league baseball and TBS, those numbers are really low. I don't think rampage will ever be that low. And it's not like they cancel it or anything. Um, and again, every year that bad number uh, gets lower and lower. So like if I say 0.05, maybe in five years, 0.05 is a good number. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it probably won't be. It probably won't be a good number, but you know, I mean, like 0.15 um, doesn't sound like a good number. And now, if I look at the TV cable numbers, you know, it's it's not that bad of a number. It's it's it'll it'll get you up there. Um, you know, in the top, you know, depending on the night, you know, it can get you pretty high in in the final standings. Um, what was this week? Uh, um, weren't they like number? Uh, Rampage was number 10 at 0.15, you know, on, on Friday night. So yeah, it, it, uh, you know, a few years ago, 0.15 ain't getting, ain't getting in the top 10. And is it similar with NXT or is it because USA and WWE's relationship is, is so tight that they're, they're given a little bit more leeway? You know, it still is over the, over the, um, station average and they will be given a little more leeway. I mean, they USA, like the, you know, it's not like they have something Tuesday in prime time for two hours that's going to beat it. You know, like they can get carried by WWE and now NASCAR and some of the sports that they're doing, um, you know, that were the former NBC's uh, sports network sports um, are are doing, you know, a lot better than um, Rampage. But it's I mean, um, than uh, NXT, but it's not um, it's not like uh, that, that those events are Tuesday night from eight to 10. If they were to get, um, I don't even know what sport you would, you know, NBA, I guess would probably run or, or um, even NHL, which you're not going to get anytime soon. But if you, um, but they almost did, I mean, they almost did in NHL. Um, but if you're going to get like one of those sports, um, you know, even if they do less than NXT, they would preempt NXT for them. Kind of like what happened with, AW and uh, you know AEW Dynamite in the NBA you know and and um, Rampage you know at times as well um, you know um, you know getting you know I mean Rampage would get pre preempted by sports that would do better but like Dynamite um, was getting preempted for NHL games if you recall and they were you know they they were doing much better numbers in that time slot than the NHL was mm -hmm. uh, from Josiah. What were some of the biggest draws in the maritime territory historically, and why do you think larger companies companies like WWE haven't brought TV there more often, given the success they have in selling out when they did? It's just so far from everything. It doesn't root easy. I mean, Halifax, historically, um, is a good city. WWE it did very well in the late 90s um, in Halifax, and... Um, you know, even later than that, you know, as far as like for, for shows and the, 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 the TVs that they did or the I remember one TV that was really, really loud, like crazy loud with Bret Hart. But, um, yeah, it's just it's just the location. It's not it's not really close to anywhere. And they do a lot less in Canada than they did before, you know, especially since the pandemic. You know, you're you're really you know, even like Calgary hasn't gotten a lot of shows. You know, it's really um Toronto, Montreal will always get them because of the two big cities. But um, yeah, Halifax, uh, not so much. You know, same reason like UFC would probably do great in Halifax, but I can't imagine them going there anytime soon. 
All right, this one is pretty similar to what we opened with when we were talking about the draft that John and I are going to do. Paul said, if you were going to start your own wrestling company and had your choice of any five wrestlers in the world, who would they be? Depends on where you want me to start it. If, if you want me to start it in Japan or Mexico, it would be very different. Um, for the United States, um, man, um, Roman Reigns probably still. Uh, I think I probably said MJF and Adam Page. Um, Will Ospreay, I think I could do something really, really big with. I think he's got special charisma um, and just an absolutely fantastic wrestler. Um, and then, um, man, like who? Uh, Seth Rollins, Matt Riddle, Cody Rhodes, uh, you know, maybe. Um, just it's all situational because, you know, you got to go with like who – who would be hot now, but who do you also think will be hot years down the line? Um, you know, maybe theory. I mean, they're, they're going so hard with him. I mean, I'm not necessarily sold on him, but I do think that if they start with this push on him now and don't give up just by the fact that they pushed him, you know, one of the things that gets people over is just being pushed and, and being in that mix, especially now where, you know, there's no real metric of you go out there and, and draw or don't draw and they give up on you or they push you harder when you, you know, sneak in and draw. That doesn't happen that much. It's really just kind of the product. I mean, I guess there's a few people in AEW that, that may make that difference. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, um, God, uh, I would have said Becky Lynch for sure. Now I'm not as sure about that one. And as far as upcomers, I don't, I don't know. Um, Bianca, maybe, um, Sasha Banks. So, you know, if I'm AW like, and Sasha Banks is, is come, can come at a decent price. She has a big fan base. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I could so, I mean, I, the thing is, I don't know what, what she is going to want, but, um, but I do figure that, that Tony Khan will, will, will go very high for her. I mm -hmm. mean, but if, if it's, is it high enough to satisfy her that I don't know. I think Sasha would be my number one as well, but you do have to wonder, you know, is she is she possibly going to be doing other stuff on the outside, which in the beginning I think would be great for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if she's part-time doing other stuff and she, comes, she becomes a big star doing other stuff that benefits you, um, if she leaves, obviously, then, you know, it doesn't benefit you. As how, much. how high would you be on, I guess, the more prospect folks, folks who are not ready yet, but in two years with the level of wrestling that I imagine you would want in your promotion, like someone like Braun Breaker. And I'm Braun sure Bra you, would Braun, not, Braun, you wouldn't Braun, give him the Braun Breaker name, but. Yeah, the Bra Braun Breaker actually would be should be like one of your top picks because when you consider his age mm -hmm. and how and how quickly his aptitude for everything like that. I think he needs to improve a little bit as far as promos. I mean, I don't find him like just kind of like standing there that kind of like badass is always flexing and everything. Yeah. I mean, it's it's good for NXT. Um, on the main roster, it feels like someone, you know what I mean? Not the top guy, but, but you know, a, one of the cool baby faces or cool heels. Um, but not, you know, but I mean, again, we're talking about a guy with very, very, very little experience and in the ring. You know, he may be someone who just, you know, absolutely, if he continues to improve, you know, he may be amazing. Nick Wayne is another one. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could probably, you know, it's so early, seven, he just turned 17, um, but he might end up being, um, you know, again, you get that guy and you get him on TV young and he improves at a quick rate like he has in the last year. Uh, you know, he may be another Will Ospreay and, um, you know, then that, so, so. Um, and he's got height, which is a good thing. We, we don't know about his talking ability. Um, obviously, that's going to be a key. But the idea of a young guy who's a super worker, um, that's, all, that's a good guy to have, you know, especially when, when he's 17 years old. So. Are there any other and, – and I know Nick has some sort of, you know, agreement with AEW when, when, when he does turn 18. But are there any other people outside of the big 
two companies, and I guess you know even Impact uh, has guys like Josh Alexander who would probably be be fairly high on your list, but it just independent folks in the U.S. Like, are there like who's unsigned? I guess is is kind of the question, and and would be Bandito. Uh, yeah, that's that's one. Um, I mean, and he's got a lot of charisma, and he's and he's pretty young. Um, so he he, I could I could see. I could see him. Plus, you know, one of the things, I mean, if when we look at the future, well, one of the things that we should look at is that the Hispanic demo will grow. Um, but, you know, getting the Hispanic guy over as that superstar, nobody's really gone all the way with it. And then there's the fear you alienate by doing so. So it's a tough one. But, you know, I would think you know, Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero proved that you can do a lot of business, um, you know, aiming at the, you know, I mean, you aim at everyone, but the Hispanic demo, you know, and, and WWE always has over-indexed with the Hispanic demo anyway, um, you know, that that could, you know, somebody like that maybe could be someone who brings in, you know, that audience because you're, you, you're always looking for that mainstream guy and it's so hard you know and it's harder now than ever because of the, the way media is fragmented to have that guy but um you know bandito could could be that you know a guy yeah all right and since this is the uh, the dave Meltzer uh, wrestling organization here how high would you have someone like Orange Cassidy on your list? Because he I wouldn't does... have had I wouldn't have had him a couple of years ago, <laughs> and I'd have been so wrong. Um, I mean, I wouldn't have him high, high, but I mean, as far as somebody in the promotion, I think that uh, it's it's a gimmick that appeals to, um, you know casual fans if that's the right word it's mm -hmm. somebody different um but he's not that young like if he was 27 i would have him really high at 37 i mean i would still have him is he really 37 i think so. something in that range wow you know i i'd have to look it up but i think he's i think he's mid to late 30s yeah you know but if, like if he was 27 um but still it's like i don't know like um like he can be a guy and he can sell merchandise and and everything but he's still I still don't know that he's a guy that you can make the flag bearer of your entire company. I think he's a good guy to have in the company, though. Wikipedia has him at 38 years old. There you go. Wow. I bet nobody believed that, huh? No, I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's, he's, I know he's always been, because he was around forever, you know, in, in Chikara, um, you know, under other names. So, um, yeah, he's not a young guy and he has been hurt. So, I mean, I would really want to build around, you know, really, if I was going to start, I would want to build around younger people. Here's an interesting question. Uh, since The Observer is a paid product, do you mind when people do podcasts or maybe they're writing blog posts about basically The Observer and the stories in The Observer, even from a historical standpoint? No, it's, it's, it's not, I don't, I don't even think about it because it's out of my control. You know, you can't like, you can't stop it. And, and, um, I mean, no, it's nothing. It's just the nature of the, there's a lot of natures of the beast. Things always change. You the, know, and all. the, the example here, and I, I don't know, cause I don't listen to Conrad's shows, but I guess, uh, in some of them, like he's like just reading issues and, and going over stories. But I mean, you know, that is the historical record, right? Like, yeah, it is. And some people try to make it not be and, and all that. But uh, yeah. All right. So from uh, Matt, from watching wrestling to gathering news to writing The Observer, how does an average day today in 2022 compare to, say, 30 years ago? So 30 years ago is... 1992 um it's much much harder i was i had um i worked very very hard in 1992 extremely hard but i had a lot more free time in 1992 than i have now um i mean it's uh you know but it's still um 1992 was on the phone all day and all night 
2022 is um, sending emails and asking questions to people on email, you know, throughout the day. So that's the difference. Uh, all right. So next question is, so this is back to what we talked about the other day on one of the Wrestling Observer radios, which is Tony Khan sort of saying, oh, yeah, we'd be open to working with WWE. Obviously, we, we talked about that and, and whether that is was real or not. But let's say that, that they did decide. What do you think would be the biggest AEW versus WWE main event that you could possibly do? Roman Reigns and CM Punk. Which is funny because that would have been a WWF or WWE main event a few years ago if uh, yeah. Punk hadn't left. Yeah, yeah, it's still the biggest. Um, Roman Reigns and John Moxley uh, would be a big one. Um, yeah, um, it's funny, the, the old Shield guys against each other. I know. That's, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Uh, okay, from Chad. If Tony Khan signed Will Ospreay or any New Japan wrestler to a full-time AEW contract, would that be the end of their partnership? It depends on how they approach it. Um, if they do it with exclusivity, um, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, if they do it where, you know, we'll sign him, but he's gonna, he can do a couple of tours a year for you, we're business partners, then it shouldn't be. Um, you know, and you, you know, if you get him for G, you know, he can still go for G1 and he can work here most of the year, but we'll let him go to the big shows. Then I think there would be no problem. Um, but yeah, you know, it, 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 you know, something like that could, if, if AEW, you know, starts stripping new Japan of talent, um, you know, that could be a problem. And I think that, that they're, uh, very much. You know, at the beginning, they did sign a lot of guys, you know, like, like you know, Chuck Taylor and Trent and people like that, that, that caused a rift, you know, for sure in New Japan. But now I think that... Um, well, I mean, know, Omega New was the biggest one, right? Yes. Yeah, of course. But um, but those ones were, were different because it wasn't like... I think that there was an understanding that, that you know, Omega was going to be the top, top, top guy, whereas like somebody like Trent was just a guy who... But they were not on good terms then. And and perhaps if at that period of time, you know, when the original meetings took place, they could have worked that stuff out. And because at the time, you know, New Japan was very high on Trent. And maybe they would just, you know, say, OK, you know, New Japan's really high on him. There are working partners. Maybe we can get Trent for some dates. Um, you know, Trent and Chuck Taylor come in for some tag matches um, and you would do it in a way that you would work together. I think that's the key is um, just communication and and working together, you know, Tony, more than most, um, more than almost anyone really seems like he wants to work in conjunction with other companies. And we've seen it with Tokyo Joshi pro and, you know, now with rev pro in England and obviously new Japan and allowing his guys like Moxley and Eddie Kingston, I don't know if allowing is the word because it's part of their deal, but those guys are working those guys work a lot of indies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like they're just working like an indie once every two months. I mean, they're they're out there a lot. They're working as much as as they pretty much want, and they're pretty much allowed. You know, I mean, there may be some days where, um, you know, that he he won't let them because of conflicts. But essentially, I think that they're working. You know, especially because uh, AEW only runs weekends during um, you know um, pay per view weeks that those guys have a lot of free Fridays and Saturdays. And, and, and so it kind of works out really well that they can do their TV. And then they, you know, in the midweek when there's not, there's hardly any Indies and then, um, you know, they can do their Indies on the weekend. When the original negotiations uh, happened between the talent that became AEW and new Japan what was the original idea for like the Bucks and Omega? Did they go to New Japan and say, "Hey, we're creating this new company and we want to work directly with you guys"? And like, what what was did did they yeah. also say they wanted to go back to New Japan and do stuff on for New Japan and kind of do like a joint thing? Like, I, I'm I, I don't remember what those original negotiations were, but it well, seems I like was I was I was there and I certainly talked to people. But I was not obviously at the actual meetings, although I did talk to people from both sides after. And and but 
the idea from the AEW standpoint, from Tony Khan's standpoint, was that they were under the assumption that, you know, they would they were going to I think his mentality was at the time that they would run house shows, but not a lot of house shows, like maybe 52, 52 TVs and maybe 15 weeks of house shows, mm-hmm. you know, 15 Saturday nights a year on house shows. And they would not book house shows when like New Japan has a Dominion or New Japan has a, you know, a major show. Those would be the weekends they would be off. And Omega and the Young Bucks and Cody Rhodes and those guys would go to Japan for the big shows the way that they had been doing. You know, I mean, in, in at, this, at by, by that time, um, those guys weren't doing as many, you know, Cody was never really, except for G1, doing long tours. Um, the Young Bucks had toned down on longer tours because they didn't want to be away from their family as much. I mean, they did a little bit. Um, Kenny obviously was doing G1s and, and a couple of other tours. But the idea that they would all be available for your big shows and they would work together, that was absolutely part of the the package, you know, that they wanted, you know, that good relationship. And obviously, at the same time, the idea that, uh, you know, they could bring in Okada and Tanahashi and, and those guys uh, when, you know, you know, when when New Japan was down, that would have been the, the, the you know, the hope for the current New Japan management team. Do you think they would have been I, obviously you can't hindsight, you know, obviously we know what AEW is now. But like, imagine if that was the idea today, like for New Japan, that that's kind of a great deal. Yeah. Yeah. I think they just didn't they didn't take seriously that this group founded by some guy who's never worked in wrestling and and where you, your executives are you know pro wrestlers was going to have any staying power i mean they just probably thought you know it's like you know and and you know like let's face it like 95 times out of 100 they'd been right you know these this stuff now this, this stuff with the rich guy coming in who's never worked in wrestling um has never worked before this is the first time um that anyone has ever taken it to this level so you know they're they would have had healthy skepticism for historically good reasons. I mean, we all did, you know, I mean, I, I, I never thought it was a guarantee that this would work. I mean, I did. I mean, I was pretty comfortable after uh, January, 2020, but then COVID hit, which changed everything again. Um, But, you know, it's like, when they, you know the first week they started it's still like it's begin you know not beginner's luck but it's like you know you still need staying power and i was always like you know we don't know what it's going to be a year from now it could collapse we don't know um i think that the one thing and and, and, and we still don't know no i mean i've seen you know we've mm-hmm. seen we've seen companies much bigger than this go down fast you know historically right so so it's not like this is a lock that like oh they're they're good to go and they're smooth i mean i think that they're in pretty good shape um, I don't think they're going to do stupid things. Um, and um, but, you know, there's so many things that happen, like with the economy and, you know, I mean, that it's completely out of your control. Like nothing's guaranteed forever. All right. We're going back a ways here from Richard. Was there any uh, ever any talk of doing the Road Warriors versus the Rock and Roll Express in Jim Crockett Promotions? Granted, both teams were baby faces. It feels like a Crockett Cup match could have been awesome. Was Dusty just afraid of hindering either team's popularity by putting them against each other? Yeah, I think so, because they never did. They never did in Crockett. Like, they they did a four-way at the Superdome um, with a couple of other teams. Um, which was actually kind of the unique thing of when those two teams went against each other. But Crockett, Dusty never wanted to do it because they um, they were different appeals, and I don't think that he um, the Road Warriors didn't really want to sell, and I don't think he wanted. He, I don't think Dusty wanted to make the Rock and Roll Express not look good. It was tough to look good with the Road Warriors. So a few years later, they did do the Road Warriors against the Steiners, and they did the finish, which was kind of the the famous finish of both teams kind of pinning each other and then one raises their shoulder up at the end. Did, was there anything to h- how you put that match together? A lot. Yes. Because the road Warriors didn't really want to lose. So they had to convince them to lose a certain way to get the pin that they needed for that night. So yes, it was, um, it was difficult. You know, once the road warriors started losing, they were more, um, I guess, acceptable to it, but there was a period where, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to lose. And, and to be fair, you know, you wouldn't want to beat them very often either. You know, would rarely want to beat them because um, they were drawing money and and their the invincibility aura, like with Hogan, 
and with Brody and those guys was so strong that you don't want to ruin it by by beating them. All right, from Chris, why did Steve Strong slash Steve DeSalvo not end up being a bigger star? Seems like he was perfect for what WWF was looking for, but he never made it, and he got a Russell Crap gimmick in WCW that we saw a handful of times on TV before he vanished. Um, you know, just he wasn't that great in the ring. Um, he was a pretty good promo guy. He definitely worked well as an arrogant heel in Stampede Wrestling. Um, and I guess he did well in Montreal as well, Steve Strong. Um, it, you know, they just didn't pick his number, you know, and, and go with it. That's the thing I think if Vince picked him and went with it, you know, maybe, you know, he he could have made it. I, I, I never um, saw him, though, as um, – I always saw him as someone, you know, who who – I, I wasn't sold on as far as like the big picture. I, I wasn't sold on him, even though he had a good body. There was something I thought, you know, and he could talk. I thought there was something still missing. All right. From Dylan, who listens to the fight game podcast on the F4W podcast network. Was there any possibility? This is a funny one of the boogeyman getting a push in 2006 or a big push his victory over Booker T and the character itself really resonated with people my age at that time as I was a kid, and he was someone all uh, everyone always talked about. He really resonated with people of my age for some reason. Yeah, you know, it was that gimmick. Um, I think that what hurt him was his age and the fact that he wasn't any good in the ring. I think that if he was um, 10 years younger or 12 years younger, uh, I think they would have gone a lot further with him. I think that the feeling was is he got hurt a couple of times, which stalled his progress as well. So I think that that and, and just coming in, you know, he came in, he was already over 40. So it was kind of like in their mind, you know, even if he gets over, it's, you know, they, they were never going to go all the way with him because of because of that. So, um, yeah, I think the age the age was probably um, the key factor. All right, uh, so this is about Vince, the Vince situation. Does the news of the four NDAs inspire others to possibly threaten to come forward, uh, both on the female side as well as the male side, uh, obviously affected by bullying and sort of you know that culture? I think so. I don't know. What do you think? I think so. I, the, the hard part for me is how public... Because I think there's two different scenarios. One, if you if you are seeing what has worked in order to to get money, and you were a part of this thing, and you're like, "Wow, why didn't I do this?" That's probably done privately. But there's also this public side of, do you really not like Vince, and do you want to make the story bigger than it is, and do you come out publicly? But, but nobody nobody wants to be no wrestler wants to be the one to attempt to take down Vince because number one, I think that you're probably going to fail. And number two, this the fear that you're done in the business. Well, if what if they're this. retired? If they're retired and they decide to say that they're never going to come back, and they have that in their head. Um, yeah, those are the people who might go in there, but they're probably just looking for a payoff. They're not looking for social change. You know, we've never seen anyone. Um, you know, we don't. We never had a. You know, I don't know what you know. Kirk Flood's motives really were, but um, you know, we've never had that person who sacrificed their Kaepernick. career. Oh, Kaepernick in football too. Yeah, that's a different. That's a totally different story. Yeah, no. We've it's... never had anyone like that in 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 wrestling who would just, um, you know. And and he, it wasn't like he was trying to get owners. Um, you know, he was going. He didn't. It's not like he went after any specific owners. He was. Um, his situation was different. Yeah, uh, and I guess the the, uh, the way that I look at this is, to me, and we may be aging ourselves with this because this isn't going to go out to one of the feeds in, in, in a, at least over a week. But when it comes to like this story and how this story continues on, it already feels like the news cycle is done with this thing until something else comes out. And if Agre that is, agreed, if and it may, it may, it's, it's a weird one because, um, and, I, and whatever it is, I don't know how you even have, something because if it was much bigger than what we have i think that we would know it you know because somebody would have said something uh, maybe not but you know when you have a 7.5 million dollar settlement i mean i'm sure there. you know i don't say i'm sure 
I doubt there's one anywhere close to that out there, you know, um, they're investigating. And um, so it's kind of like, I mean, I don't know where it goes from here, but I, I don't know that there, like there might be more smaller settlements that we don't know about maybe, but those, those will be, you could write about them and we'll write about them and, you know, and all that, but that's not going to really change the big thing at this point now that it's out. And it's not like, you know, like, uh, I don't, I don't anticipate like 40 people coming out, you know, you know what I mean? Where, yeah. you know, where that, that were something like that, which is, then it would be, be you know, a, a really big story. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. These are some quicker hits. Uh, actually one of these may not be, but just things that were sort of on my mind, which is, uh, so I'm reading old observers, 98, uh, observers, and you were doing a radio show every Wednesday from, uh, I guess it was a, a radio station in Phoenix from 10 oh, a.m. to 11 a.m. Yeah. Who was who was this with and like how? Like, I don't even I don't even remember. Um, they just kind of asked me and I did it for a while and then we stopped doing it. Um, yeah. You know, it was, it was me and a guy named um, Don Arnold, who was a retired wrestler who since passed away, who would. You know, we I would talk about the current stuff. He would kind of reminisce about the old stuff, and the host was just like a big fan who liked both of us. Oh wow! Yeah, that yeah. that that's actually a pretty interesting uh, thing to have you as like the the news guy and the history guy, and then an old like did, did was there any differences in in what like because you know how when you talk with older older athletes in general, like they remember their time as like the only good time in in you know in, yeah the guy the guy was cool. You know, I mean, he was very, um, you know, he was, I, I believe he was a reader and he was very, you know, um, very interested in the current scene and, and in, you know, into it. So it was, the dynamic worked. I mean, as far as it was easy, you know, for me, um, you know, yeah, and it was, it was, it was definitely fun. All right. Now, this is a question that came to my mind uh, with sort of Orange Cassidy as the example. Now, I don't know what Tony's... Um, idea is for where you go with Orange Cassidy and how or how high you can go with Orange Cassidy. But have you asked historical bookers what they do when someone gets over unexpectedly or like way more than they kind of booked them to get over? I mean, that happens all the time. And you, you go with the flow and you don't, you know, in theory, you don't, you know, pass up something that's handed to you. You know, I mean, everyone, I think, that was ever, you know, maybe Hogan being the exception. But I think, and, and Roman as well, because they handpicked Roman. But most of the people who got over to a gigantic degree, and I wouldn't even say Roman got over to a gigantic, a gigantic degree in that in that sense. But most of the people who were your real game changers, it just happened. I mean, it was nobody saw Austin as being that until he already was. Um, the Rock, I mean, certainly was, was a handpicked to be a star, but I don't think anyone dreamed he would be as big a star as he was. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us saw something in Cena, but did you see him at that at the level that he ended up being? I mean, probably not. And I, and I was very high on him from you know, you know, the start of his career as somebody who I thought could be a pretty big star. But uh, as big as he got, you know, who, who's going to know that? And Vince certainly didn't. It just, you know, they sort of went with it, and then he just kind of took off. Okay, so let's say that Tony's thought process of something like Orange is, he's going to be very popular, he's going to sell merchandise, the, you know, the, this fan base loves him. But what if he gets over even more than that? Like, you, you could theoretically make him the champion because he gets over so much more than you, than you realized he would? I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think he's over in that way that you make him the champion. I mean, it would be, you know, it might be a cool moment, but I don't, I don't, you know, especially the way Tony books champions, I don't expect that he sees it at that level. I mean, but if the guy all of a sudden, like if he was going to catch fire at the level of being a world champion, I think it already would have happened. I think that his, you know what I mean? I think it's like how, however big that thing goes, um, you know, it's not going to be any bigger than it was. I think it might stay the same. Um, so I don't, I don't see it. I don't see him in that role. Um, but I mean, as far as like, 
could somebody accidentally just kind of sneak in and eventually be a champion? Yes, I do think that that can and, and will happen. I mean, I think it's pretty arguable that the person coming out of Forbidden Door who was the most over coming out of Forbidden Door w- was possibly Orange Cassidy. Like, that next day, uh, or I'm sorry, the next TV, like, that crowd was crazy for this guy. Yeah. Well, I mean, it had a sensational match. Um, but it's like, look, he just, now granted it was with Tony Nese, but he just made an event Rampage, and Rampage, you know, wasn't like the Rampage number was through the roof or anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, true. But, but that doesn't happen with anyone. I mean, like, like you know, even when the place was going nuts for Hook, I there was only like one or two times where I saw like examples of him actually moving ratings. And now it's sort of like that thing. I don't know. It just like snuck away. Mm-hmm. Like it was, it was there like that one. I'm kind of disappointed in that. It's like they, they had him up to that tag team match and now they just kind of, I don't know. Like they, he's, he's not getting enough uh, TV time or maybe they just think that there's, that they don't have, I don't know. They don't know what to do with them. Um, and I, you know, I don't know. He, 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 he got over really, really big as that cult thing. And I just don't feel he's been, um, used a lot of late and it's kind of dissipated, I think. All right. Two more quick ones. Uh, favorite wrestling book. Oh man. Um, maybe, uh, Maybe Brett, maybe the um, in, in its own way, the Shamrock book by Jonathan Snowden for a, the Pillman book. The, um, the Brett book in the published form or in the form that you had seen before? Either form. Um, the first Foley book, Jericho, you know, some of his books were very entertaining to read. Anything pre 99 ish? Mm, no, because before that they were more kayfabe I mean, obviously when it came out, the Luthes book was, I mean, I memorized that book, every single thing in that book, because it was the only book of its kind with somebody like that. Um, but there weren't a lot of books with that kind of, you know, in that era, you know, the Dynamite Kid book when it first came out was, was, um, you Crazy. know, really, yeah, yeah. You know, it was, it was, it was a level that uh, we hadn't had before. Um, but you know, I think the books, you know, I mean, people got more and more past the, the kayfabe thing. And so the books became more and more honest. So, um, yeah, I mean, those, those, um, those are some of the ones that come to mind. I mean, some of the historical books, like the stampede wrestling book, the, the chic book that Brian Solomon did, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, you know, or, or Pat, Pat LaProd's Andre book. Like I like those books, but they're also, um, because they really, I mean, when I see like the level of research of going through and really like learning what made these guys tick, Pat, I mean, Pat did such a great job with the Andre book. Um, you know, that, that was, um, that was one of my favorites because it was just, um, you know, and the Pillman book again was also one of my favorites because I knew Pillman and I knew the stories and I'm reading this book and it's just like, you know, he not only did he know stuff that I didn't know, but, um, you know, the stuff that I did know, he he hit it 100 percent, you know, right on on everything. And um, so, you know, I like those outside things, the outside perspective on the Sheik, you know, it was a uh, was really interesting to read back on the stuff like when I was a kid and and, you know, the Toronto win streak and just the politics behind it, which I sort of knew, but I didn't know everything about it or the details because it was just like the 70s when stuff was so much more quiet. Mm hmm. All right, last one. I don't know if I've asked you this on air before. It's possible that I have, but I'll just ask it again. Okay, Hulk Hogan, 1982. He's in Rocky Three. If that moment doesn't happen, does that change anything about his career? I think no, but I'm not. I, I, I mean, I think that what would have happened is he still was going to get over just as big in the AWA. And once that happened, everybody would know. I mean, it, it, it did help, but I think Hogan, I just think Hogan had it. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I don't think it, I don't think it changes wrestling. If you didn't get asked to be in that movie, it helped him for sure. But man, I, um, I think he still would have made it, you know, I, you know, just because of right guy at the right time, right. Talking, 
you know um yeah i mean because even before the movie i thought you know he had a lot of potential to be something really really big and in the awa like he was already getting there before the movie you know came out he, you know you could already feel it so um yeah, I, I don't. I don't think it's. A, I don't. I don't think things change. No. Did uh, obviously when he became the Hulk Hogan, the Vince McMahon version of Hulk Hogan, uh, did doing outside stuff uh, also help him, or did it more so help WWF or awareness? Because I saw there's this old photo that I found. I, I forgot where I. I think I found it on Reddit of him on the love boat. <laughs> like that was a big show. It probably helped a little bit. You know, he was he was mainstream and and doing things like that, you know, made you like wrestlers didn't do stuff like that. So it kind of gave him a like he was like a real world celebrity in a business where the guys weren't real world celebrities. They yeah. were just celebrities when they're within their little world. So and and I don't think anyone like even even like like The Rock now, of course, but The Rock when he was a wrestler was never the celebrity that Hogan was as a wrestler. And Austin was not either, even though Austin was a great, great drawing card who sold a ridiculous amount of merchandise. There were still a lot of people who didn't know who Steve Austin was. Whereas Hulk, I think just because the TV was so visible and, and there were fewer stations and, um, you know, his stuff got covered in different places at a different level. I think that he was um, the biggest... You know, I think still the biggest mainstream star as a wrestler, and The Rock is a bigger mainstream star as a movie star. 